All right, there's a notification I'm looking for, so we are live. <laughs> we had one Sunday there that, um, oh, it was Christmas Sunday, uh, Christmas Eve Sunday, I guess you'd call it. Um, thankfully, Lynetta had, uh, well, you had reached out to Lynetta, and I'm glad you did, because Lynetta came up, I was sitting on the front pew because of the children's program and everything, and she said, uh, Tabitha said we didn't go live. And I, I had, I had, my phone was up on the organ, so I had no, and I didn't have my smartwatch on. I had my regular watch because uh, my smartwatch is a little loose because wintertime, you know, things are looser in wintertime, right? <laughs> so sometimes. And uh, so I didn't have that, but she leaned up. I said, yeah. I said, so the next time when I went up, uh, I just rebooted it, uh, this, and uh, then I got the notification. Yeah, so I was I was glad. Boy, thank you for that. And and Lynetta was on top of that as well. But uh, the next week I made sure I had my phone with me because usually my smartwatch notifies me when it goes live. So I just look and I know. And, and I know when George Robertson is here because he's watching the front door through the camera. And since that's live, uh, it's notified every time somebody walks through the front door and I feel my wrist vibrate. <laughs> I think, okay, George's got an eye on things. And uh, so, but yeah, so that, I was certainly glad uh, that that, uh, that that happened. So, <clears throat> all right, what's happening? Okay, Sunday, we're going to observe the Lord's Table. We, we did that, of course, New Year's Eve. I thought that was a great way to kind of bring everything together. Just had a good time. It, it wasn't, wasn't too much, wasn't too little. I mean, I just thought it was enjoyable to just get together a little bit and, and um, uh, enjoy that time together and have the, the fellowship of the of communion, and uh, this Sunday, this Sunday, I'll start a new series. I don't know how long we'll be in it, but from the book of Judges, lesser known people, <laughs> but they're unlikely heroes, and we're going to start the first two weeks. A man by the name of Ehud, uh, he's a man with a plan, and uh, his life was kind of enamored with disadvantages, and so this week I'm going to talk about what those disadvantages are. And I'm going to cut it off there because we have communion this Sunday. I'm not going to overdo it. Uh, and then the following Sunday, we'll talk about how God takes all those disadvantages and turns them into advantages. And there's a lot for us to learn in that. And then also on the 14th, I've got to double check with him, but we're rescheduled to have Eric Erizari with us from uh, Foundations Christian Counseling. Uh, they're out of Clinton Baptist Church. He was supposed to be with us before, but he, he does work part-time at the island. They had an outage the last time he was supposed to be here. He got tied up. I don't know if that will happen again. I hope it doesn't, but uh, hoping to hear from him. I want to be able to put a face to that ministry for you and um, talk a little bit about how we might be able to support them. I've already recommended them to, to several people, and uh, if, if we get uh, involved uh, with supporting that ministry financially, uh, any of our folks that, that are connected with our church that take advantage of that uh, will receive a discount because of what we uh, contribute. Uh, Eric and his wife uh, work together. Uh, they're both uh, certified counselors. Uh, they have degrees from uh, Clark Summit Bible College. Uh, they are graduates of uh, the Bible Institute. And uh, so uh, just him and I, he, we touch, he touches base with me every couple of months. We'll meet for breakfast and just kind of talk about what's going on in the ministry there as well as uh, our ministry here. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to you meeting Eric Irizarry. And uh, just, a, just a great guy. I don't know if he'll have his wife with him or not, but uh, time will tell. But he's going to take about 10 or 15 minutes on the 14th to tell us a little bit about foundations and, and what that's all about. Boy, it's just a great resource that, that we have available to us, so close to us. All right, well, Hebrews chapter 11. Last time we began those first three verses, which really kind of give us uh, this definition of faith when it talks about it being uh, the evidence of things not seen. Now, there's evidence of things that we can't see. Remember First Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where it talks about, while we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Uh, you can see me in the way of seeing this physical form by which I represent, but you really don't see me, and I really don't see you, because we are living souls, and one of these days, um, uh, the body, uh, the soul is going to check out of the body, 
Uh, just like the epitaph, here lies the body of old man Pease, lying beneath the flowers and trees. But Pease ain't here. He went to God. There's nothing left but this old pod. Uh, a woman was trying to re restate that. She had heard that in church, and she got a little mixed up. She said, here lies the body of old man Pease, lying beneath the uh, flowers and trees. But Pease ain't here, just the shell. She had him going in a completely different direction than, uh, than what the pod did. So anyway, I'll let you figure out that. <laughs> and, uh, but nonetheless, you know, uh, I can't see your soul, you can't see mine, but that is the eternal nature of who we are. But faith, there's evidence of faith. When we talk about faith, faith is really a, kind of an abstract word. And how we understand faith, and we spent a lot of weeks, and, and I hope you benefited from it half as much as I did, from the time that we spent in the book of James, because that's James's whole premise is the idea that, uh, you know, you say you have faith, but you don't have any works. How do I know your faith is real? Because faith without works is dead. He said it's a dead faith. There's no evidence of what you say you believe in. He's not saying that you say by works, not by any means. Um, <clears throat> but he was saying that there will be evidence of your faith. And of course, we, we all have faith in a lot of different things. And when we talk about faith, we're talking about the object of our faith being Jesus Christ. And so <clears throat> to illustrate these, this definition of faith in the first three verses, he comes back and he starts talking about certain individuals. He says, if you want to know what it looks like, here's what it looks like. And gives us uh, these wonderful screenshots uh, of, of these people who lived by faith. <clears throat> According to Google, there are thousands of halls of fame, uh, walls of fame, walks of fame. Uh, some we're familiar with, you know, there is a Pro Football Hall of Fame. There's a Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, I've been to it several times, and I was able to take Hayden with it. me one time down in St. Augustine, Florida, is the World Golf Hall of Fame, which I just, man, I really enjoyed going through that thing. And um, uh, But there's a lot of them. But uh, there are some lesser known ones. If you're in Milwaukee, you can visit the International Clown Hall of Fame. They even have the total clown experience to where you can be dressed up like a clown and get a guided tour. I'm not sure about this one. Our, the, our, uh, the RV Manufactured Housing Hall of Fame. Uh, that's, um, that's in Elkhart, Indiana. At least it's there now. I don't know if it travels or if it just stays in the same place. Uh, in Texas, in Texas of all places, there is the Cockroach Hall of Fame. Now, now, what kind of cockroaches you have to have if you have a cockroach hall of fame? They have a, a miniature Statue of Liberty. Instead of a torch, it's holding up a cockroach. Um, they even have one uh, cockroach that's dressed up in sequins, playing a tiny grand piano with a candelabra, and that he is called Liberoche. And uh, so, it's... Can't make that up. As for polka fans, there's the international Cleveland-style polka hall, hall of fame. But um, the one that's now on my bucket list <laughs> is, uh, is the Pig Hall of Fame at Pool's Barbecue in East Elijah, Georgia. <laughs> okay, uh, They have over 3,000 signs and billboards commemorating famous pigs. We must have given it all, I'm thinking. But uh, the owner likes to, uh, uh, to refer to the place as the Taj Mahog. So I don't know. Uh, and they have a dining room, a separate dining room called the, Ho the Hog Rock Cafe. And so a little play on all this stuff. So that one I wouldn't mind checking out a little bit. You know, I'm really big into barbecue. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, Texas ruined me uh, when I went uh, to Dallas, Fort Worth area. Although I did find some pretty good stuff in uh, in Cary, uh, I was able to uh, have dinner one night with um, Paul Barreca. He was there representing his mission board, and we went out to dinner to it. I mean, this place was just—you would—I I don't even know how. I wouldn't have found it if they they had it listed uh, in our programs which was a program of telling us what the workshops were and who the speakers were. And then they had a list of, here are places that you can go to eat. And uh, sure enough, that was on there. And thank goodness for GPS, because I would have 
<laughs> Never found it. Just a little tiny place. But boy, was it uh, well worth the time. So <clears throat> when you think about Hall of Fames, people are usually in a Hall of Fame because somebody has selected them for some reason or for some accomplishment. In Hebrews chapter 11, God has chosen a list some individuals. And we have 16 heroes who are mentioned by name. Uh, but then it goes on and talks about and kind of groups them into to a larger aspect of those who, who gave the ultimate sacrifice for their faith. And uh, I think the implication is, and we'll see it, is that uh, in reality it will and can include us uh, as well. And so uh, keep that in mind. <clears throat> now over the next couple of months we're going to examine the lives of these heroes of faith, and tonight we'll deal with two of them, uh, Abel and Enoch. Next week we're going to talk about Noah, but we begin here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, by faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, uh, though he is dead, he still speaks. Then by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that uh, before uh, his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it's impossible to please him, to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he, uh, that he is, we could interject that he is God, and that he is the rewarder of them who seek him. So, as we begin to stroll through this hall of faith, we, we begin with these two characters of Abel and Enoch and see what they teach us here tonight. First of all, <clears throat> Abel will demonstrate for us worshiping by faith. Worshiping by faith. I, I think sometimes, again, we get kind of abstract in our definitions and we think about worship as the fact that, well, we'll show up, you know, and if my emotions are moved and, and, and if I happen to find uh, the spirit of worship in me, then, then I guess I'll experience worship. No, there, there ought to be a consciousness in regards that we prepare ourselves for worship. Uh, just like uh, next week when we come to the communion table. Hopefully we prepare ourselves for the communion table. We ought to prepare ourselves for church. Uh, we talked a little bit about that in the Christmas season when I talked about the, uh, the, the wise, uh, was it, the, oh, no, the shepherds, excuse me. We talked about the wise men, the angels, and the shepherds. But the shepherds, although they were really taken aback by these angels appearing, these guys, one of the reasons I believe that God chose them was because they were devout men who were expecting God to show up. They, they, they were of that faith. They were of that reality. Uh, think about, you know, uh, Greg just took us through that portion of, uh, of the Gospel of John. Uh, Andrew's excitement. Come see him. This is, this is the Messiah. What was he saying? This is, this is, we've been waiting for God to show up. And guess what? He's here, you see. We need more of that in our fellowship. We need more of that in our church of people expecting God to show up. Um, a lot of times we're just taken back. Uh, I just, uh, I'll never forget one time uh, uh, during the invitation, I was standing down front and making a call uh, for response at the end of the service. And a couple got up and they started walking down the aisle. And I, uh, and I thought, well, this is rude. You're going to leave right in the middle of my invitation. And then they turned the corner and come down to me and said they want to join the church. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, that's what I was asking for. I'm sorry. But, you know, I'm thinking, Where? Well, my head is just not in the game here. Um, but that, that's the reality. You know, we're, I'm thinking, yeah, nobody's really going to respond to anything I just said. And so, you know, they must be leaving. Not the case. But we ought to understand there is this aspect of worshiping by faith. Worshiping God is an important responsibility. It's an important responsibility. And uh, Cain and Abel are the first example of two people approaching God with sacrifice in worship. And it's very important. And it's important that we get it right. Don't have time to go into it now, but um, maybe you're familiar with the story of Aaron's sons, uh, Nadab and Abihu, who offered strange fire. God consumed them. And uh, Aaron was pretty upset about it, but then Moses set him straight, and he said, hey, look, you know what? 
when it comes to worshiping God, God says, this is how you approach me, you see. And, and, and so we don't always give it the thought that it requires. And Hebrews 11, 4 says, By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. You know, the first family is really dysfunctional. You say, yeah, well, I know a lot about the Bidens, but no, that's not who I'm talking about there. The first family, the original first family, Adam and Eve, uh, they, they wound up with a pretty dysfunctional family because of sin. And, um, you know, the first child was Cain, and the second was Abel, and then later on uh, we hear about Seth, and those are really all the, the, the names of any children of Adam and Eve that we have. We know that Adam lived 800 years after Seth was born, and the Bible just tells us that he fathered a veritable army of sons and daughters after that. And, uh, but these are the only ones that are named. <clears throat> and so, in the garden, Adam and Eve had unfettered access to God the Creator, but uh, we know that sin changed that. And so sin, because of sin, <clears throat> there had to become a prerequisite where, why, by which man ultimately would approach God. And uh, that was seen in the sacrifice of the animal. We believe it to be a lamb. It doesn't say it was a lamb. But we know that blood was shed in order to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. And that became a precedent for what they would do to understand the nature of how we must come to God now. There is sacrifice that we might come to you. And the sacrifice would require the shedding of blood. And so we go back to Genesis chapter 4, and we kind of pick up the story. We know that Abel was a shepherd and Cain was a farmer. And that was really irrelevant to the fact of how they approached, should have approached God. But in Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 and 5, so it said, It came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. I'll pause there just for a moment. Many scholars believe that that phrase, in the course of time, not meaning the fact that this is the first time that they're doing this. That they had been doing this for a long time. But this time was going to be different. Because verse 4 says, Abel on his part also brought of the firstling of his flocks and of the fat portions, and the Lord had regard to Abel and his offering. But for Cain, for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry uh, and his countenance fell. And so when the Bible talks about, you know, Abel is dead, but he's still speaking. Well, what is he saying? Well, that's our first faith lesson is that faith driven offerings please God. Faith driven offerings please God. You know, when Jesus has that encounter with the woman at Sychar, the woman at the well, um, you know, she gets into that religious discussion about him. She's well, the Jews, you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place that we ought to worship. My people say, you know, in Mount Gerizim, you know, and, and she's making, I don't know, it might have been a diversion to tactic because Jesus had just pointed out the fact that she's had five husbands and the guy she's not with now is not her husband. Yeah, well, let's, let's change the subject here and talk about religion. And, um, but Jesus' response says, listen, true worshipers must worship God in spirit and truth. He said, you're hung up. You're hung up on where? God is really concerned with how. How you worship Him. Not where, but how you worship Him. And this idea of spirit and truth has to do with the right attitude. And, and this is what we're going to see later on, that, that ultimately with Cain was the problem was an attitude problem. We must worship the way that God tells us to worship in his word. And these two offerings represent two very different things. Um, we see the difference between religion and salvation. Religion is humanity trying to reach out to God, where salvation is God reaching out to man. Religion is based on human performance, and salvation is based upon heavenly pardon. And what was Cain's offering? Cain's offering was that which he, by working in his farm, was able to produce. So it represented the works of his own hands. And that's, that's the problem. You see, he, his offering represents human performance. God says, you don't come to me on the basis of human performance. You're going to come on the basis of sacrifice. 
And uh, Abel offered that sacrificial lamb. And, and if we wonder again, where, where did he get this idea from? Well, I believe, obviously, they must have been taught this by their parents, Adam and Eve. And think about that. Think about the, 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 the relevance of that, that Adam and Eve could go back and say, hey, look, here's what happened. We had perfect fellowship with God. And, and boy, how painful it must have been to, you know, to admit my decision is the reason why we're in this situation. And um, I remember Dr. John Phillips talking about that, and I'll mention him again when we get to Enoch. Because Adam would have been alive during the time of Enoch. And he said, could you imagine Enoch or anybody else in that time frame going to Adam and saying, Adam, what was it like? What do you mean? He said, Paradise. What was it like? What was it like to have perfect fellowship with God? See, we come into this world already severed from that perfect fellowship. And, and, and we come to that through faith and God's grace. Adam knew what it was to have it perfectly and lost it. I can't even begin to imagine that. And so they would have conveyed to them, look, here's what happened. We had perfect fellowship with God. We disobeyed God. We willfully, we chose to disobey God. And we felt the separation of that fellowship that we had with God. And God made a sacrifice for us that would demonstrate the necessity that if we're going to come to him, there needs to be this covering. But this covering comes at the cost of the shedding of blood. And of course, we, we know that down through the scripture, all the way, this would be the representation of what would be, uh, or how they would come to God, you see. And uh, if we judge the two sacrifices that day, you know, we, we might have thought, well, you know, hey, look, Cain's just bringing what he has available to him. This, this is his area of expertise, you know. Wouldn't God be pleased with that? Well, the problem was God had told him what was necessary. But... Cain's attitude was wrong. Abel's attitude was one of faith. Abel had enough faith to believe that one day a lamb would die and take away his sins and God recognized his faith and rewarded his faith by accepting that worship, you see. What he's saying is, that because one of the other things that Adam and Eve no doubt would have shared with them, look, yes, here's what happened because sin came into the world, but God has also made a promise to us that there's going to be a redeemer that there's going to be someone who he is going to send himself that will rectify this problem. And that's why we believe this happened. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus called Abel a prophet. In Hebrew chapter 11, says, though Abel is dead, he's still speaking. He's proclaiming what? And we spent a couple of weeks on that scarlet thread that runs throughout the Bible which ultimately concludes in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so, we understand the nature of it. You say, well, does this idea of Jesus being a sacrificial lamb go all the way back to the... Absolutely, because Revelation 13, it says Jesus is the lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. That was, that was the solution, that was the promise that God was giving to Adam and Eve after they sinned. So, Cain represents religion. And um, man-made religion uh, usually results in, in death. It kills. You know, wars are still fought today over religion. I mean, that's uh, a lot of the conflict in the world. We know that's, uh, uh, that's what's going on. And, of course, <clears throat> a real familiar part of the story when God confronts uh, Cain you know, he asks him, and remember, God doesn't ask for information, just like in the garden when he said, Adam, where are you? It doesn't mean that God, you know, couldn't find him. He knew where he was. It was so Adam could respond, so that Adam knew where Adam was in his separation from God's fellowship. And so God asks Cain, where is your brother? He already knows. And, uh, of course, Cain, that, that, that famous statement, am I my brother's keeper? Well, the answer to that is yes. Yes, you are. There is a responsibility that you have for one another. And um, God makes it very clear 
because God makes the statement. He says, Cain, if you do right, you know that you'll be accepted. See, this is why I know that this wasn't like the first time they did this. And, you know, it's like, well, it's the first time they did it. And so, you know, God's going to cut him some slack because he got it wrong. No, they had been doing this. And God's statement, in other words, you can rephrase it. Cain, uh, Cain, you know what I accept and what I reject. But you decided this time you're going to go out on your own and you want it to be performance-based. And, and I'm going to reject it every time. You know it. You already know this. Dr. Warren Wiersbe gives us some great insight on this when he wrote, Cain wasn't rejected because of his offering, but his offering was rejected because of Cain. His heart wasn't right with God. Uh, you can write it down or turn to it, but over in the epistle of 1 John, boy, this gives us some real insight. 1 John chapter 3 and verses 11 through 13. Cain already had a wicked, sinful heart. And in 1 John 3 verses 11 through 13, it says, for this is the message that we have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Now listen, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Why? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. He said, understand something. Cain killed his brother because he had a wicked heart. He had the wrong spirit. Jesus called Satan a murderer from the beginning. And so Cain was acting in regards to the influence of a wicked heart. You know, I mean, there's still that conflict today. When, when we say exclusively that salvation comes from no other except Jesus Christ and his, the sacrifice that he made on the cross, people say, well, it's narrow-minded. You know, isn't there, there can be the Buddhist way, the Muslim way, the Christian way. And it, no, no, there, there's not. Not if you believe the Bible. It doesn't give room for that. When Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. People don't like that, you see. We learn about worship by faith from Abel. Secondly, Enoch walked by faith. Some have referred to him as the first astronaut. I don't know if that's true or not. But he is the great-grandfather, great-grandfather of Noah. Great-grandfather of Noah. And in verse 5, Hebrews 11, it says, By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. What, what an interesting contrast. Have you, that's why I put these two together. Have you ever thought about that? The Bible tells us Abel is dead, but yet still speaks, and Enoch didn't die at all. Boy, very different, you see. Enoch's name means dedicated, and he's only one of two men in the Old Testament who did not see death. Remember who the other one was? Elijah. Yeah, Elijah was taken up in the chariot of fire. And um, uh, matter of fact, that word caught up in the Septuagint is translated into Latin, the word rapture. He was raptured. Again, I was thinking about uh, Dr. John Phillips again. Uh, loved it as much as I love to listen to Alistair Begg because of that Scottish accent. Same thing with uh, Dr. Phillips is Welsh. And um, we have some of the DVDs around here. You can't, you can't find a lot of it online, is, and, and most of it's not very good. Matter of fact, what you do find online is from the Jacksonville Pastors Conference. But um, uh, one of the first times I heard Dr. Phillips, his message was on Enoch, and it was entitled, A Candidate for Rapture. <laughs> and uh, walks beautifully through uh, this relationship that Enoch had with God. And for that, we go back to Genesis chapter 5. In Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, where it gives us the, the backstory here. In verse 21, it says, Enoch lived 65 years and he became the father of, you know, this name, Methuselah. Methuselah is the one who is the oldest recorded living person. Now, I say recorded, I don't know if somebody lived longer. We know that he lived 969 years. 
but the oldest recorded. But Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Then it says, then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah, and he had other sons and daughters. And so all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Um, you know, the question about why people live so long. Uh, the earth, all those under the curse of sin, I still don't think, uh, you know, we were. Ju- it was just really starting to uh, ramp up a lot of the things that make us sick all the time now and everything. Plus, remember, before the flood, it had not rained, and there was that canopy. Uh, things were just a lot different. I think that uh, the environment was not nearly as under corruption as it is after the flood and even through today, right? And so that may be a reflection of why um, they live so long. We know that after the flood, man's, I mean, you see it, the ages get a lot shorter. And then right up until now, I don't know what the average is now, something like 74 or something of that nature. Used to be a lot less than that, uh, just, you know, 60 years ago. And uh, that's Hayden and I were just talking about that recently. And I don't know if you ever saw that movie. Uh, they made a movie out of the cartoon of Flintstones. You know, and, and Fred and Barney are, are eating lunch. And Fred's eating this great big brontosaurus leg or whatever it is. And, and Barney tells him, you, you know, Fred, you really, you should watch what you eat. Maybe you shouldn't be eating so much meat. He says, oh, Barney said, my dad, my dad ate meat every day of his life. And he lived to a ripe old age of 38. You know, <laughs> Well, maybe the Stone Age, that was uh, really cheating the odds. I don't know. But nonetheless, uh, we know that, uh, you know, as the corruption has built in, in the world in which we live, it certainly hasn't helped our health. But when he turned 65, he had a son. And we're going to talk more about this next week because the name Methuselah is very important because it means when he is gone, it will come. When he is gone, it will come. And uh, that connects to next week's lesson about Noah. So what do you think is coming? <laughs> it's coming as judgment. The flood is coming. When he is gone. Uh, Methuselah was the guy you should have kept your eye on. Because when he's gone, things are going to get really bad. But Methuselah, uh, it implies that before he was... And the other thing that we don't want to overlook too, when it says that Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah, then Enoch walked with God. I, I, I don't think we make too much out of it when we say, you know what, here was a man, I don't know what he was doing for those first 65 years of his life, but when he became a father, he started looking at things a little differently. Uh, most of your parents we, we will testify to that. All of a sudden now you realize you're responsible for other human beings. And uh, when they're real little, I felt my biggest responsibility was just to make sure they were still alive when Brenda got home, you know. And it just, uh, uh, you know, when she would go away, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I got to keep these kids. And uh, and I remember we were playing, uh, and I don't think Gwen was born yet. Hayden was probably about two. We were playing in the backyard. And we had this great big concrete step, and I'd made the kids hot dogs, and so we're sitting out there and. Hayden did something. He slipped on a step and he smashed his face into the side of the concrete. Now he's got all this blood coming out of his mouth. I thought he spit out his tongue. It was just part of the hot dog that he had in his mouth. Right? <laughs> like, oh my God, this kid done spit out his tongue. I am just, you know. And then I'm trying to keep it, you know, he's bleeding. Hayden's a trooper though, man. I mean, he can take a shot. And, and so I'm trying to see where he's bleeding and what he's done. He wants to keep eating his hot dog. Which was perfect because the blood, uh, the bun soaked up most of the blood. <laughs> it was like, okay, this is working all right. So, uh, you know, I got a, you know, I got a washcloth and filled it with ice. You know, and I called my mother. I think I killed one of the kids. What, what do I do? Um, uh, but yeah, it wasn't nearly as bad as it looked. But yeah, when he spit that piece of that hot dog, I, oh no, I was, this, is, this is bad. And uh, it's, uh, it just scared me to no end. But you know, when you have these kids, and um, I don't know if they think that just because they've grown up that you think less about them or worry about them any less, because I don't, I really don't. Um, And knowing what responsibilities they carry now as parents as as well. 
But, uh, you know, it might have been a big turning point in Enoch's life. He became a father, and it says he began to walk with God. He realized, you know what, I don't want to walk alone in this endeavor. And, and so there's some good advice there, without a doubt, uh, that with children we need to be walking with God. <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about Enoch was not, for God took him. The King James Bible refers to it as he was translated. It is the word uh, metatheame. Uh, we get the English word uh, metathesis, metathesis, which means a change of place or condition. It can mean to be transposed. We talk about transposing music. Uh, just, you know, I love the Christmas music, but, but a lot of the traditional hymns, they are written in such a high key. It's like, I just don't have that. Before we had the baby grand piano, we had a clavinova which was kind of cool because Brenda was able to, to change the, the key in that to where it would be transposed into a lower key. And it's like, thank you, that's good. Um, in this case, it's trans, talking about uh, being transposed into a higher key. He went from this place to the presence of God. And that's, that's really being transposed. And the faith lesson here is uh, walking with God creates an intimate fellowship with God. Now, of course, when we talk about walking with God, that's a figure of speech. It's a, it's a metaphor of a lifestyle whereby we have this relationship with God that is more intimate. And um, that's what God wants us to come back to because of what was lost because of sin. And God doesn't want us to think about him as some impersonal God. I've told you before, in a lot of the pagan cultures, like we talked a lot about the pagan gods of Greece, and, and Rome had a ton of them as well. And a lot of what they did was try to appease their gods because they didn't want a personal relationship with their god because they thought, no, if we can just keep our gods happy, they'll leave us alone because we're afraid if they're mad, they're going to kill us. And that's what happened. Was, remember, Epimenides was trying to solve, they, they, they had that whole plague and they said, well, one of our gods is mad. We don't know who it is. We've got to figure out who it is. And, and, and so that was the relationship they had. But no, God wants to have a personal relationship with us. And the Bible says in Micah 6 that God really only requires several basic things. I love Micah 6, 8. It says, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Well, that's a simple formula right there. To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. I mean, that's just something we can look and, and kind of use as a m measurement for whether, we're not, whether or not we're walking with God. Now, what I like about Enoch is as well that he really is the first one to preach the message of the second coming. Uh, just before the book of Revelation in the New Testament is that little book of Jude. It's only one chapter. Unless you're entering it into Bible Gateway, you do have to put chapter 1 or it won't come up. <laughs> so, <laughs> but Jude 1, there's only one chapter, verses 14 and 50 give us some insight into Enoch where it talks about, and it was also these men talking about counterfeit believers, that Enoch... In the, uh, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord, will, uh, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convince all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they had done in their ungodly way and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. It was a message of the fact that, listen, God's going to show up. There's that message again. God is going to show up. When he does, there's going to be a judgment day. There's a reality of that. And so he was preaching the second coming. And we're still preaching it today. Again, as I revert back to my memories of John Phillips and his message on a candidate for rapture. And again, he's just so eloquent the way that he speaks in his delivery. And, and he just, he would just paint a picture in your mind that you could just see so vividly 
He said, Enoch walked with God. And he said, you can just imagine, he's walking with God. He has this wonderful fellowship with God, and they're walking, and they're walking. And finally, Enoch says, well, Father, the day is late. I suppose I should return home. And God turns to Enoch and says, well, you know, we're closer to my house than we are yours. Why don't you just stay with me? <laughs> Candidate for rapture, man. There he is. And I, I always love, too, the way he point out, you know, the Bible says, and he was not. Which tells us people were probably looking for him because Enoch was, and now he's not. What happened to this guy? You know, um, I, I had uh, a parent bring me one of their little children, and what a great question! He said she's got a question about something, and, and wanted to know about the prophetic calendar of what was going to happen next. I go, wow, how much time you got? And I'm thinking, okay, I got to bring this down to a you know 10, 11 year old level here, but. Um, as I explained to her about, you know, the rapture, I said the church is going to be taken out before the seven years of tribulation, and I believe that. Um, again, in regards to the message of Noah, is very clear about the fact that uh, they weren't in the judgment; they were preserved from the judgment. But I told her, I said, you know, all these people are going to be taken up; they're going to be taken out. Can you imagine the chaos and the confusion? I've seen these video clips where people have tried to depict this idea because, you know, God forbid you're flying and, you know, your pilot's a Christian because he's gone, you know. And one of the things that struck me so hard, it was a scene in a mall and all these little kids were gone, you know, and one little kid that was holding a balloon, the balloon just floating away and the clothes are there, but the kid is gone and the mother is just perplexed. And I said, but you know what? There's going to come somebody out of the uh, out, out of the shadows that's going to explain this to everybody, and they're going to accept his explanation, and he is the antichrist. He's going to deceive them, like the world has never been deceived. But there is going to be an element of us who will be taken up. We'll be taken out of here. And I'd much rather be raptured than have to go by way of the grave. Uh, no question about that. But, but that's the reality. And 1 Thessalonians speaks to this in great detail. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. As a matter of fact, I don't have time. Maybe we'll be another study after we get through this. But I love 1 2 Thessalonians because Thessalonians speaks expressly about the fact uh, and makes a wonderful doctrinal lack of a better word, argument for the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. But here in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. In other words, those believers who have already died, their bodies have gone to the grave, but we understand they are absent from the body, but they are present with the Lord, the part we can't see. And uh, when the Lord comes, their bodies will be resurrected, re re reunited with their soul. It'll be a resurrected body like Christ. And uh, then it says, we who are alive and remain will be called up together. And there's that phrase, caught up. We get that Latin word that gives us the word rapture. With them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. If we experience that, I mean, here one moment, go on the next. Here one moment, we were and then we were not. So how's our faith? Do we have a worshiping faith like Abel? Do we know what God expects of us when it comes to worship? Well, I'll tell you, there's, there, there's a lot of things I see that go on in churches in the name of worship that I got to wonder. I really got to wonder. There was this church down, it was in North or South Carolina, I can't remember which one. They would open with secular rock music as, as the opening song to their services. And of course the low lights and flashing lights and smoke and all the rest of it and everything. I'm thinking, is, is this really honoring to God? I, I don't know. Man. I just... No. Um, 
But there's a lot that goes on in the name of worship that I think is far from it. And we can do a study on that as well because the Bible is pretty clear about what worship is and what's expected. And do we have a walking faith like Enoch? I mean that we're walking with him. And one of these days he just says, look, you're closer. Some of us are a lot closer than others. We're, <laughs> we're closer now. You know, we, we've, got, we've got more days behind us than we got ahead of us. And in reality, everybody potentially does because we don't know how much time we have. And uh, I, I know my wife doesn't like me to say this, but it's true how I feel. People talk about, you know, life is, is short. I, I, I really, the older I get, I feel like it's really too long. I, there's things to enjoy in this life, but there's things I, concerns I have not only for my children, but now my grandchildren. I think, what kind of world are they going to have? Kind of, kind of shook me this this week. My uh, my cousin Dawn, or my cousin Dawn, my niece Dawn, um, my brother Greg and Cindy's daughter, oldest daughter. Um, she had uh, posted a picture <coughs> of farm that I grew up on in Mannington and somebody responded with a picture and then my son Dan went out there Monday and uh, the current owner they're tearing the house down the outer walls have already been tore down I'm thinking Ooh, that's where my bedroom was it's it's exposed to the outside now and Dan I know for Dan Dan it meant a whole lot to him and, and but he walked around and took these pictures and posted them and but yet his perspective was so good. He says, wonderful memories. He says, but I realize it's just a building. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's all it is. It's just a building. I haven't been down Quirkernick Road in, in a long time, probably two years or more, because it's changed so much since it was when I was a kid that I just can't hardly look down there. And, and I'm thinking now, you'll drive by there one of these days, not too long from now, and it'll just be open field all the way back down to the creek, uh, Mannington Creek that leads into Mannington Meadow and the railroad tracks. Matter of fact, you can see that side of it. There's a train ride out of Woodstown that takes that track uh, that goes behind what was my father's farm and it goes over to where Mannington Mills is and back. Uh, Dan and uh, the Branch family went on that. He was telling me about that. But yeah, it's tough when you see that and you think, Man, you just thought that would be there forever, you know? And, and it's and it's gone. So when I go to Salem, you say, well, where do you go now when you go to Salem? I go to Eastview Cemetery. <laughs> I got a couple of plots out there. I don't know exactly where. I, I think I'll have to be buried at low tide. Um, I'm on the backside, I'm pretty sure. But my grandparents on both sides are buried there. Um, my great-grandfather's buried there many of my great aunts and uncles and so forth. But I don't know whether it'll be through the graveyard or whether it'll be through the rapture. But you know what? You realize how much changed uh, changes. I, I've talked to people about that right through the center of Cedarville here. I could go through and just between Franklin Street, and Main Street, and, uh, uh, and, and Maple Avenue, and, uh, the amount of people who were members of our church just <laughs> in that triangle. We've all gone home to be with the Lord in the time I've been here. You know, there's different people living in those homes, and so much has changed. And um, uh, yeah, it doesn't stay the same, right? It doesn't stay the same. But that's okay, because I'm not living for this world. If I'm walking with God, you know, I know things in this world will change, and most of them won't change for the better. But like Abraham, looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. <laughs> And realizing that is my ultimate destination. And I can trust him no matter what. And you know what? I see that with eyes of faith. I don't see it, but it's unseen. But it's more real than even the farmhouse that I grew up in down in Mannington, without a question. So. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time we've had tonight to study your word. God, continue to just speak to our hearts in regards to our faith. Lord, uh, as we consider our worship, God, may we look deep within ourselves. May worship begin, I pray, before we ever arrive corporately to a church service. Uh, I pray that our walk with you, God, that's, that's a daily thing. We walk every day. God, uh, do we consider that we walk with you in all the choices, decisions, uh, the, the challenges that we're faced with? 
God, the blessings that we receive. God, may we not take it for granted. We thank you for that wonderful future that is before us with such certainty because of your word has promised. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.